it's in Tel Aviv, images that change everything. After days on the razor's edge, Ukraine is now a nation at war. It won't be bloodless. The port of entry is now closed. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common. Talk of rebuilding the temple is no longer considered a fringe idea. I want us to read our key text for this series that is found in Luke chapter 21, verse 25. If you have a notepad, note, note taker, take, take some paper out, write some things down. I think this is going to help us today realize that we are in the end of the end times. Luke 21, verse 25, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. Interesting that there is a solar eclipse scheduled during this series, April 8th. We didn't schedule it, but, but it is happening on April 8th. Sun, moon, and stars, it will be signs. Everybody's talking about the solar eclipse. There's actually a lunar eclipse tonight. It happens two weeks before a solar eclipse. Just throwing it out there. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, say it with me, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. The word redemption means to buy back, to be set free by a ransom. Praise God for redemption that we have through the blood of Jesus. The price has been paid for those who believe. Praise God for that. Why is redemption needed? Well, God created a perfect, sinless world, and sin has wrecked havoc on it. God created a place, a place called Eden, so that he could dwell with a people. How many of you know that God wants to dwell with his people? How many of you know God is not a loner? God loves fellowship. He wants fellowship with his people. And so he needed, he needed to provide a redemption plan so he could have fellowship with his people. Yet in this place of paradise... The devil, in the form of a serpent, came at Eve and deceived her, suggesting that God was withholding something from them. I want you to write this down. Let's start right here. Deception. Deception is the fundamental strategy of Satan as he tempts man towards sin. Deception is the fundamental strategy. And early in the book of Genesis, man is deceived and he enters into sin and man takes on a sin nature. I start here. Today, because the scripture we're going to look at details a very sinful world in the end times. And we need to understand that the world's narrative on the human condition is very different from God's narrative. Stay with me here. The world's narrative is, is this. And because sometimes we can be so much in the world, we can almost forget that, that the world's narrative is not the right narrative. The world's narrative is this. Man is basically good. Now, when I say that, many of you might think, yeah, I kind of think so too. But that's not the Bible's narrative. The world's narrative is man is basically good and man can continue to improve his basically good condition. It's, it's about being good. It's about being better, getting better. But that's not what the Bible teaches. God's narrative is because of sin and the sin nature, man is not good. Someone said the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The Bible says the heart is what? The heart is deceitful. The heart is desperately wicked. The problem is in the heart of man. And so God says mankind needs a savior. Mankind needs to, a savior to save him from his sin because from his sin will bring judgment. And this week, we celebrate Passion Week, right? We celebrate Good Friday. We celebrate the things that Jesus did in obedience to the Father, willing to go to a cruel cross and pay the ransom or pay the price for our sin, people who have sinful hearts, so that we can be saved, so that we can be rescued from what? From judgment, from the coming wrath of God. Now, you don't hear the words judgment and wrath a lot in church because we pastors want everybody to feel good when they come to church. 
But if we're going to be a Bible church and we're going to preach and teach Scripture, we need to say, tell the bad news along with the good news. And really, you don't have any good news unless you first tell the bad news. And the bad news is we are not inherently good. We are inherently bad. We are people of sin. We have sinned, and we've come fallen short of the glory of God. And so we need a Savior, and that's Jesus. And that's what we celebrate 20, I mean, 52 weeks out of the year. But really, this week, we recognize what Jesus did for us on the cross. Is everybody with me so far? I wanted to lay out that foundation as we get into this. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. We're going to spend our time here today looking at Jesus' own words about the end times. So, so whatever I say today, if you don't like it, blame it on Jesus. Okay. And I think we'll leave here with a greater sense of what our spiritual posture should be as we look into the future with hopeful expectation. These words from Jesus take place during his final journey toward Jerusalem, toward that Palm Sunday, toward that week uh, of passion. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. In other words, the kingdom of God is not coming in the way you think it is. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. In other words, I'm here. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them. Those are false teachers. Verse 24, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Keep reading. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it, Jesus said. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. That last phrase seems kind of weird. But the idea is this. When the condition is right for the vultures to gather, or just as certainly as a bird of prey will go to a dead body, when the conditions are right on the earth, then Jesus will return. When the conditions are right in the earth, Jesus is saying, then I will return. And there will be certain conditions that are going to be ripe for his return, right? We talked about some of them two weeks ago. Prophecy about Israel must be fulfilled. Israel is God's timepiece. It has been fulfilled. Also, we talked about travel and knowledge will increase. We heard more about that last week, and it certainly has. In the same way, Jesus outlines certain social and spiritual conditions that will be present in the earth just prior to his return. Remember, Jesus' return is mentioned 329 times in Scripture and one in every 30 verses in the New Testament. It's a very significant Bible doctrine. So, so the question is not, why are we talking about this? But the question is, should be, why are we not talking about this more? Right? Jesus talks about the spiritual condition in the earth at the time of his return. He says this in verse 22 of Luke 17. He says, the days are coming when you will want to see, you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. In other words, you will be looking for the Messiah, you will be wanting to see the Messiah so bad you might think someone is who is not. You'll become anxious for my return and false Christ and prophets will rise up to deceive you. Remember that I said this today. Remember, because in the last days, there's going to be more voices that other people are going to be looking to and say, we need to follow him or we need to follow her. 
And Jesus says in verse 20, 23, they will say to you, look there or look here. But Jesus says, don't go out and follow them. Jesus clearly warns his disciples to be discerning. He says, don't follow every teacher. Be very discerning. I'm saying be discerning with technology. Be discerning with social media. Don't follow everyone who just sounds like they've got something good to say. Teach your kids to not like or follow everything or everyone. Maybe ask yourself, should my kids be on social media at all? I realize that's not going to be popular at your house. But you heard last week how deceptive AI and how deceptive all things technology can be. It has great, great potential for deception. Jesus is saying, as deception increases, don't follow the wrong voices. If someone says they're the Messiah, they're not. That's the truth. If someone says they're the Messiah, they're not. He warns us in verse 23, don't go out and follow them. But why do I say that? How can I say that so emphatically? Because when Jesus returns, it, there will, it will be a no doubter. You will know. If someone says they saw Jesus at Waffle House in Chattanooga, no, they didn't. No. We will know without a doubt when Jesus returns. Revelation 1, 7, get ready to shout. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. He will be seen. Look at verse 24 again. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. I mean, talk about a display in the sky. It will be seen around the world. It, it will be seen on one side of the world where it's day. It'll be seen on the other side of the world where it's night. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So make sure we know that. Again, we're talking about the great day of the Lord or the great return of the Lord, which we know as the rapture of the church, which is the first phase of the Lord's coming. Then seven years later, there will be another return, the second return of Jesus, where he actually comes down and plants his feet on this planet, on the Mount of Olives. And that's another teaching for two weeks from now. So we're going to be talking about the rapture and the second coming of the Lord in more specificity. Specificity in two weeks. But verse 25 of Luke 17 says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So Jesus is saying, he meaning I, he says, I must suffer many things. I'll be rejected by this generation. As Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's saying, this generation is going to reject me. And that's what this Passion Week is all about. So understand here, even before Jesus dies sacrificially, even before he dies to pay the price for sin for our full redemption, He's talking about his return. He says, I'm coming back again. And then here in Luke 17, Jesus transitions into the social condition or social climate of the earth that will be present at that time. This is where you need to lean in. Look what Jesus says as he talks about the days surrounding his return. We need to know this. Verse 26 of Luke 17 says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 28 says, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot. Jesus says, just prior to my coming, the sinful conditions will be similar to those days, to those days of Noah and those days of Lot. Now, Noah and Lot are both mentioned in the book of Genesis, and there are about 250 years between Noah and Lot. The Bible tells us they, these were both righteous men. Both of these righteous men had righteous families, yet both were living in very unrighteous and ungodly times. How many of you know it's possible to live for Christ in unrighteous times? Oh, it better be. <laughs> it's possible to live for Jesus in, in unrighteous times. It's possible for you to be a sold-out witness and a sold-out Christian for Jesus in post-Christian America. It is possible. It's possible to be a witness and have a testimony of the Lord Jesus in a world where sinfulness and apostasy is all around us. But how many of you know we can't do that on our own? We need his help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he told his apostles in Acts 1-8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Even in an ungodly generation, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world and the earth. That's you and I today. 
we need the power of the Holy Spirit to be that witness and be light in a very dark world. Look what the Bible says then about dark days. He's talking about Noah's day first. He says this, or the Bible says this in Genesis 6 verse 5. It says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wow, that's, a, that's pretty bad. The only thoughts in their heart was that of evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and, cre and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I've made them. But Noah, what happened here? But Noah found favor. Other translations say he found grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I won't be like Noah. I won't find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor. Noah found grace. And God allowed Noah to do what? To build a place of safety. That place of safety was an ark. And he rescued him and his family and saved them from his judgment, from the, the, the judgment that was coming on the entire planet, which was what? A global flood of 40 rain. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, that is not just a kid's story. That really happened. It really happened. It's not fiction. It is real. God was judging man's sin, and before he judged the sin of the planet and man, he rescued Noah and his family, praise God. That's why oftentimes salvation is, is, is viewed, uses the metaphor of the ark or the ark of safety. In fact, the, the rapture is often viewed as this, this, this rescue moment like the ark where we are brought into this place of safety from the judgment that is coming. And Jesus said this, he said, watch, he said, in the same way, it will be that way when, in, as it was in the days of Noah, it'll be that way when I return. But he also says, in the same way as it was in the days of Lot. The end of the end times will be like the days of Lot. I better get some water before I go into this section. And Genesis tells us, that God was grieved with the sexual perversion of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not a popular passage of scripture anymore. These were twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, similar, I think, to Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'm not saying the, the social climate was the same. Maybe. Sodom, you're probably familiar with the English term sodomy because it was taken from the sexual perversion of Sodom and the widespread sexual perversion of that city. And God determined to do what? I'm, I'm just teaching what Jesus was saying. God determined to destroy those two cities. But God first sent two angels to do what? To rescue Lot and his righteous family to get them out of that environment before judgment came. And then this is how Jesus said it in verse 29. He said, but on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. That is judgment, friends. So will, it, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day when the Son of Man returns. And so it is today, I think, in many similar ways than it, as it was in the days of Lot. Do you see that or do I need to break it down further? No, I think you see that. Jesus also says in addition to all of that wickedness and all of that sexual perversion, in the end, in the end, life is still going to go on. It's going to go on and feel kind of normal. I'm sure most of you kind of have a life that's going on. It feels kind of normal. Life is going to kind of just go on. People are going to tolerate sinful culture and even celebrate it. For instance, there will even be praise to celebrate the things that Jesus said ultimately brings judgment. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And the truth is Jesus' followers can't have it both ways. We are either a Jesus-following, Bible-believing people or we straddle the cultural line and we are neither. Yeah, just leave that up there for a second. 
And as I said in week one, if we are Jesus followers, here's what you need to hear. We lead with what? We lead with love. We love people. We recognize all sin brings judgment. And guess what? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. We just don't have the right to dictate what the Bible says a sin is not. Or we, we don't get to determine what is not sin for this generation. The Bible is yes and amen. It's true. He changed, it's, his word changes not. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short. We all need God's grace. But we like to categorize sin and people. But we don't do that. Last week, Pastor Daniel told us that apostasy means sliding away from a previously held position or moving away from a previously held position. And that has happened in so many areas of our culture. We now improve, approve or promote things that the Bible calls sin. Pastor Daniel showed us in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, it, it says, let, let no one deceive you. For that day will not come unless there is a falling away that comes first. In fact, it will be hard to recognize when we're nearing the end because even the falling away will hardly be noticed. Luke 17, verse 27, they, they were busy eating and drinking, marrying and, and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, what were they doing? They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. What is that? That's just normal life. That's just what we do, eating and drinking and marrying and bearing and planting and building and work and play. It's springtime. Let's go take care of the yard, put down the pine straw, vacations and staycations, all the things. Life is normal. Jesus said life was going to be normal. It was going to be going on as usual, just like it was in Noah's day, just like it was in Lot's day. But the point here is that we can get so desensitized to sin and perversion in the world that we, even as Christ's followers, can be unfazed by it. But what is the righteous response? Just tolerate it and celebrate the culture? Go with the flow? No, not at all. That's not the, that's not the biblical response. The Apostle Peter gives us a glimpse, I think, of a righteous response when he says this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Peter says, and if he rescued righteous Lot, meaning God, if God rescued righteous Lot, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked or the world. And by the way, the wicked is simply those who are involved in ongoing sin, not necessarily levels of sin, but ongoing sin. The Bible, when it uses the word wicked, it's not just saying these ultra evil people that we like to call the wicked. We're not so wicked. We don't do the things they do. But no, wicked is just about this refusal to turn away from what is right and good. That's the biblical term. So we got, this, we got all this, this wickedness and this sin going on. Peter says Lot's response was that he was greatly distressed by the immoral conduct of Sodom. And in verse 8 it says, For as the, that righteous man lived among them day after day, just like we're living among people day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and he heard. Right, when the, some of you remember the story, when the two angels came to visit, they said to Lot, they said, and he was treating them as a guest as they would in that culture. They said, no, we'll just go sleep in the town square. And he said, oh, no, you can't do that. You two men can't go sleep in the town square of this city because men will try to have you. And he said, no, you cannot do that. The perversion here is too great. Sounds like this godly man, Lot, could hardly sleep at night due to the sinfulness of those cities. That was his response. It wasn't business as usual for him. Let me, let me, let me just ask you, and I, th I think that this is a great question for us as followers of Jesus. Is your spirit grieved by some of the things that you see? Or is that for somebody else to be grieved about? Or are we grieved by some of the things that come across our screens in the movies we watch, 
or that we pay to watch. You know, they do get a little, give a little movie rating on there for a reason. Because you get to choose whether you're going to watch something that may be wholesome and may be good, that's true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. Or you can choose to watch something that's full of immorality, sex, and perversion, and choose which one of those you're going to enjoy. I feel like I just need to sit down here and talk to you a little bit. I get in trouble when I get off, off the... I mean, have we slid so far away, Daniel, from this previously held position in America of what is right and what is good and what is wholesome, what is pure and what is good? I mean, what happened to the family TV of days gone by? I, I know, I know I'm of that era and of that age. But there was something good and right also. Pastor John, you, you, you remember the Dick Van Dyke show, right? <laughs> Rob and Laura Petrie. Is anybody here old enough to, besides me and, and Pastor John to remember the Dick Van Dyke? There's only about 12 hands going up. That really is a problem. But back, I mean, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even show Rob and Laura in the same bed. And they were married. It's changed. It's changed. Immorality is now primetime entertainment. It's front and center. And the world says accept it, support it, and celebrate it. And if you don't, you're the one in the wrong. Listen, that's all jacked up. That is not right. But Jesus said it would be that way when he returns. The reality is, here's the reality. This will not go on forever. What we're experiencing right now and this apostasy and this downward slide. And by the, by the way, the apostasy is that of the church not of sinful world. You can't slide away from a previously held position that you've never held before. So we, the church, need to repent of our apostasy and say, God, we believe there's power in the blood and we ask you to change us as we repent of our sinful ways and behavior. There's hope for the future. That hope is not in a future president. Just saying. That hope, if we make it to November. <laughs> oh, that hope is not in an economy on the rebound. That hope is not that we are good and somehow we're just going to get better. There's no truth and there's no hope in that. But Jesus said, just as God rescued Noah and his family and Lot and his family, he will do the same for you just prior to him bringing judgment in the earth or on the earth. Luke chapter 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Notice Jesus said, one will be taken, not all. One will be taken and one will be left. One is ready, one is not. I guess a fair question is, which one am I? So the Apostle Paul says, now when these things, when those conditions are present or begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now the question for me is, how near? Now, my redemption has happened in that I am saved and I've been paid for, bought with a price, but there is an ultimate redemption that's going to happen when the Lord returns. So let's summarize here before I close. What did Jesus say will be happening up to the end? He said, he, he said this, if you look at it closely, he said the righteous will be in the minority. Noah and, fam Noah and Lot's families were certainly in the minority. In post-Christian America, we are no longer the home team. We're not. Leading up to Jesus' coming, true followers of Jesus are in the minority. He also said there will be wickedness, sinful behavior. It will be normal and celebrated. He's telling us that God will rescue the righteous, which is our blessed hope, the rapture of the church, and that God will bring judgment on a wicked world. Remember, these are not my ideas. This is what Jesus is teaching us. Jesus said it. So the question is, what do we do? 
We have, a, we have a mission to fulfill. What do we exist to do here at Chapel Hill? We exist to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That means we need to know the bad news and we need to know the good news. We need to help guide them into a growing relationship with Jesus. What else can we do? I want to say this loud and clear again this Sunday. Love people. Love all people. Not just people that look like you, that act like you, behave like you, or that even holds the same things as true as you. But love people. When Jesus saw the woman that was, the, the scripture says she was caught in the very act of adultery. You know, he, he, he didn't go and condemn her. He said, actually, I'm not, I don't condemn you at all. What I'm just telling you is stop doing that and go and sin no more. So he loved her enough to tell her the truth and say, listen, that's not going to get you anywhere. In fact, that's going to bring you judgment, not only by the religious leaders here, but that's going to bring you judgment from God. So, so go and sin no more. I love you. That's got to be our posture. And we can do both, right? We can do both. We can love people and we can tell them truth. Now the world says we can't do this, but we know that we can. So that's what we do. We love people. And we say to people, there's grace and there's power to overcome that sin. Because some people are just caught in sin. They're in bondage to sin. They don't see any way out of it. This is the way I am. This is who I am. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, Jesus changes everything. Jesus can transform you from the inside out and make you a brand new creature. We've got to preach the power and the grace of God in the lives of people so they can begin to see there is hope to be different and to live different for the glory of God. So we've got to love people enough to tell them. And finally this, I want to say this. There's two opposing missions going on in the world, world today. It's light and darkness. The mission of the world or the darkness is everyone be conformed, be conformed, be conformed. This is what you should be conformed to. But our mission to the world is what? Be transformed. Be transformed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Lord, I ask you to help us as we put our faith and our hope in you. We ask you to transform us. Transform me into your save me help me let your blood touch my life today your blood is enough this morning we're going to receive Holy Communion together you should have received a little communion packet on the way in if you didn't there are some tables here in the front and back towards the middle of the room and if you didn't receive one just lean over and ask someone maybe to hand you one. Maybe if you're on the end of the row, you can slip out and get some for your row. If some people in your row, slip up your hand if you didn't receive one, but you're a believer in Jesus and you want to participate. I want to ask our, ho our host, maybe even those on the end of the row, just help those that are in your row that have their hand up. Make sure they get one, okay? Just take a minute and do this. This is okay for us just to move around and make sure we have this. If you're watching online, go ahead and take that to get some bread, get some juice, something that you can receive the elements with. Here's what I want to say. I think in this moment, after a message like this, I trust that the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, has brought some conviction to our hearts. To, to think that we have this many people in this room and thousands watching online, and everybody's good. No sin, no need to change, nothing needs to change in my life. I mean, that's a lie. The truth is, we all need Jesus. We all probably need an area of our life where we need his blood to touch it and forgive us and wash us and cleanse it. So I'm going to ask you in these next few moments, just the next few seconds, I'm going to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. It says, so let a man, a woman examine themselves. Yeah. Let's just take a minute and examine our hearts. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I think everybody's got the commun communion elements now. Let's just examine our hearts. Let the Holy Spirit say, Holy Spirit, examine my heart. I want my heart to be right, to be righteous, to be clean, to be free of all sin. So Holy Spirit, show me where there's sin in my life. This is a simple way to examine your heart. Holy Spirit, show me where there's sin in my life. And I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me. I repent. Let your blood wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Simple prayer. Holy Spirit, examine me. Jesus, cleanse me. Wash me. Make me brand new today. Do a work in my life right now, Jesus. Do a work in my life. That's the simple prayer on this Palm Sunday. Now the Bible tells
tells us in Matthew chapter 26. It says, we have it on the screen. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So this bread represents the body of our Lord and on this Passion Week, let's think ahead to Friday, on that day, he was tortured. He was cruelly beaten. The Bible tells us he was flogged with a cat of nine tails. I won't get into all the detail of that right now, but it was a horrific, horrific punishment. And Jesus suffered that and his blood was shed in his body for you and I. And we remember that and we thank him for that. And if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, this is the time when you take this bread and say, thank you, Lord. I remember you for what you've done for me. Let's take the bread. The Bible says in the same way, they took the cup. This cup is the blood representing the blood of our Lord Jesus that was shed for you and I to pay the price, to pay the ransom for our redemption so that we could be made, so that we could be made free so that we could be restored, so that we could have eternal life, so we could be ready when he comes again. Let's take the cup together. Hallelujah. Are you ready to praise him and thank him for that? Come on, let's do that right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.